Hello and welcome back to the Puzzling Places Dev Chat. This is Dev Chat number eight. And today we're going to be talking about the Monastery of Battaglia, the puzzle that just came out last week, a new premium puzzle DLC that's available today for Quest and PlayStation as well as Pico. Uh, with me today is our art director, Shahyar Shahrabi, a, uh, a returning guest. Hi, Shah. Hey. Good to be back. Good to be back, indeed. Uh, every time we do something fun and and exciting and experimental, we always like to make a dev chat to kind of uh, talk about it, to show off a little bit of the behind the scenes, and uh, just to have a little check in with our with our community. So, yes, uh, it's also and, it's also my chance not to shut up about history. That's right. It's uh, it's a nice way to share uh, the stuff that we can't find a way to fit into the game. Um, so yeah, the, the Monastery of Battaglia is going to be what we're going to be uh, pretty much all focusing on today. Um, and yeah, let's, uh, I guess the intro here is that we wanted to create a, a puzzle that had some different uh, lighting conditions that changed about it. Um, the cool thing is this is a scan that Shah, you scanned in Portugal. So why don't you give a little bit of background on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, this is the Battaglia. It's in kind of like middle of Portugal. Um, it's historically a very, very important place for the Portuguese history and also connects to some very interesting uh, world events in some bizarre ways. And also some of our other puzzles that we have already put out there. Uh, for example, behind high walls, uh, we put out the Segovia, which relates to this location very strongly, um, even um, so-called Grad or the so-called Fortress. Um, and if you have listened to our previous dev chat with Battaglia, with the spice trade and stuff like that, this location is like an embodiment of a lot of stuff we talked about, which is quite interesting. Um, I think we have the Puzzling Places Extended Universe, aka Human History, uh, making appearances between different puzzles. But yeah, so this whole thing started with uh, me traveling in Portugal with my in-laws, and they wanted to show me a bit of the country, which we just drove through the country, which is a fantastic experience. I can recommend it to anyone, basically. And uh, we decided to take a bit of an unusual route because usually you go with highways around. But there are these national national roads, the national road number one and two. Um, the number two, for example, I can only recommend. It just cuts through Portugal from north to south, uh, where you get to see a lot of interesting spots. And we went by this location. Um, and whenever I go somewhere, there's, of course, a drone with me and uh, some scanning needs to happen. And I think as it is the same for you. And this is how this came out to be among many other scans. I think I scanned like 10 locations uh, in that trip, and this was one of them. Um, so yeah, this was how it started to be. I can show you a bit on how the location actually looks like. This is with like the environment around it. Um, as you can see, the Iberian Peninsula landscape, uh, a bit hilly. This is now the time of the year where things are a bit more green. And... Uh, yeah, the whole location is very, very important, but also at the same time, very empty. Um, this is one of the best preserved or one of the best example of like flamboyant Gothic structure in Portugal. Um, and it considering that this is where the founder of the Avish dynasty, which was like the dynasty that brought Portugal to becoming a world superpower, basically a, a naval uh, empire. The founder resides in there. It's actually quite interesting how empty the location is, probably because after the high wells were, were built, not many people actually go there. So Empty in terms of the monastery or the surrounding, like the town itself? Yeah, it's just generally not that many people around. You can see kind of in the, in the, in the skybox, right? So here we are, by the way, I'm sitting there <laughs> scanning, the <laughs> scanning the drone. And you can see in the actual thing that it's mostly empty. Um, I wish to also have some uh, videos from the location. And as you can see, it's just not much actually going on. Um, there's like a few people going around. Mm. Um, this was the road that people used to go to, uh, like back in the days before the highways. But now people, are, of course, take the faster ways. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a very beautiful place. And it's just like, I, I think it embodies something about Portugal as a country because it's it's such a small country, right? Like 11 mil million in total, right? So if you think about something like there are 33 million Kurds out there and they don't even have a country, right? And then you have Portugal with 11 million. And it's so important to certain aspects of human history. And uh, we talked about it a bit in the Behind High Walls dev chat. 
as we were talking about the spice trade and uh, the commodities going from west to east, and that was a very lucrative, like it was a very uh, good trade thing. And uh, Portugal managed to go around the Cape of Good Hope, which changed everything. This uh, monastery is built like around 15th century, something like that, 400 something, which was uh, an interesting time period for everyone who lived there. This is the time where the Black Death is going around. People are dying left and right. It's the Hundred Years' War. It's just absolutely terrible, right, in Europe. Um, it, in a couple of, like, decades, Emperor Maximilian is going to be born, so the Holy Roman Empire is going to get quite strong. Um, France is going to be able to be a bit stronger. But right now it's very destabilized. And uh, for Portugal, it was very similar, right? So a king called Ferdinand dies, um, I'm not sure if he dies of plague or if he just dies normally, but he dies and he doesn't have a proper heir. He has a daughter named Beatrice, uh, who is married to the king of Castile. Um, so for those who don't know, Spain used to be few smaller kingdoms before it became a large country, actually quite la late in, well, European history. And um, that was the time where uh, there was a lot of like rivalry between these different smaller kingdoms and Portugal was one of them. Um, so the only contender to the Portuguese throne was the son of the King of Castile, which no one was happy about uh, in Portugal. So they basically decided to give it to the half-brother of the king, uh, who was King John I or King Jean, if you say the Portuguese variation. And you could, I suppose, call it the, the War of the Johns, because like the John of Castile started fighting with the, with the other John. And... Uh, yeah, so this is where the monastery comes from because the the Portuguese actually didn't have much fighting power. And there is a guy in this story who becomes uh, quite central to the whole thing. Uh, let me see if I can find him. There is. That's the, that's, that's the guy in the, the thing. He was 24 after, you know, the, the Castile started attacking Portugal. Um, and he became the constable. So Nuno uh, Alvarez... Pereira, I think is his name, he became the, the commander and defeated forces way stronger than the forces of Portugal. And that was why the whole monastery was built, because they believed that uh, Santa Maria was the reason why that happened. Um, and they basically built the whole thing for that. And uh, this is the battle where a lot of the Castile people died, like 5,000 of them. And it shows a lot of brilliance from, from the commander here who later became the richest man in Portugal because all the nobility that sided with Castile lost their land to him, basically. And he was the closest friend of uh, King John. And uh, there are some aspects to this battle that are quite interesting. One of them is that it happens in the Hundred Years' Wars and for some pop culture is that this was one of the battles where the British were actually winning against the French uh, quite strongly. And this pattern continued until Jean of Arc actually beats uh, the, the British. Um, this was one of them. And the other one that is quite interesting is that uh, an alliance was created between Britain and Portugal. And this alliance was still exists today. It's the longest running military alliance in the world. And as a matter of fact, 2020, it was just re-signed again as a continuation of the same thing. And a lot of really interesting things happened because of this alliance. One of them was that during the Second World War, the Americans wanted to basically force Portugal to enter the war. And Portugal said, no, you can't, you know, attack our land because the Americans said we are going to uh, use the islands. Uh, Portugal said, you can't do that because we are actually allied with Britain and that's your ally. And that's how uh, Portugal actually managed to stay neutral in the, in the Second World War to the most degree. And, um, or another one was that the Portuguese queen Catharina from Braganza, who married, uh, what, who did she marry? I forgot, it doesn't matter. Uh, married the British king, actually brought tea to the British uh, from Portugal. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is why this location is actually quite interesting and very important because, uh, yeah, the, the founders of the Avish dynasty actually are there, that's their tomb. And uh, they, the, the King John was trained as a monk. He was the Grand Master of the Order of Avish which was the reason also why he was so learned. Like he was a very uh, educated king for standards of medieval time because he was religiously educated. And Philippa, who was the 
his wife, uh, which was the, the, let's say, political marriage that brought the two together. Um, she was also a very smart and capable woman, and they raised what the Portuguese called the illustrious generation. So they raised three or four uh, princes, who one of them was Henry the Navigator, who sponsored the going around the Cape of Good, Good Hope and started basically connecting Ming Dynasty China directly to Europe, which was a very, very big deal and changed the landscape of politics forever. Um, so yeah, that's basically the, the story of these locations. If you actually look inside, but that's actually not the, that's not Juan and his wife. That's uh, King Edward the Poet, which is the son, which succeeds the, the King John the First. But they are also inside. And when you go there, you will see that they're holding each other's hands. Um, it was a political marriage. They married and saw each other first like 15 days later. But they actually came to actually be quite fond of each other at the end of the life. And there's a lot of stories about how the king was very, very upset and she died. She died at the age of like 55 or something. Um, so this is, as I said before, like a very good example of French flamboyant architecture style of Gothic. Um, however, that's not the only thing. It's one of the few examples outside of England of like these, like a perpendicular Gothic style of British, which was the reason why it was because Philippa uh, Lancaster brought some architects with her. And that's why you see that this architecture is actually quite tall. When you go inside, it's a very tall architecture, which is um, not the standard uh, flamboyant architecture. The, here front is the Gothic flamboyant, but the inside is a bit taller. And uh, yeah, you have, opposite to what a lot of people think, structures like these are not built in a day. Like um, nowadays, if you want to have a house, right, you kind of commission an architect and they come and they build you a stupid cube. I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> so I hate my hate towards modern architecture. But no, they come and they just con create this concept. But that's not how buildings used to be built, right? There were seven different uh, grandmasters architects who just generationally just kind of like contributed to this. And as a matter of fact, uh, this side is like the first thing that was built. And uh, a lot of the money actually came from, from, the, from the Nuno guy. And uh, the back was added by the son because he wanted to have his, uh, well, family his, members also be next to, next to his dad. Like the mausoleum um, for the whole family then? Like a yeah, tomb. which never finished. This never finished. Uh, there was also a point where Portugal got distracted with all the gold that came from Brazil. And they started building like these crazy structures next to Lisbon. And they kind of started, you know, doing that and didn't care about this anymore. Um, as you can see, these other parts just have a completely different architecture. Uh, again, because of the reasons that the things were added later. Um, here, there's like a grave of two unknown World War One or two soldiers inside, which is also quite interesting. And there's just one giant dome inside that uh, doesn't have any columns. And mm. they actually, they hired, like they tried twice to build this and it collapsed each time. And by the, by the third time, because everyone was suspecting that, uh, you know, it's going to collapse again. The architect went and slept. After it was done, the architect was like, I'm going to sleep here tonight and just slept under the dome so that if he collapsed, he basically died. Uh, legend says oh. the dome didn't collapse, but he died of natural cause during the night. I don't know if that's true. It's a bit too good to be true. <laughs> but uh, the anecdote is there's a lot of evidence that the anecdote that he actually did sleep under it. Mm, that's like skin in the game, basically. Yeah, exactly. It was like, <laughs> mean it. Mean that this is not going to collapse. Um, so yeah, that's basically the location, like, you know, combination of different architecture, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, it's a very important location historically. Uh, it means a lot to the history of Europe uh, because the Avish dynasty started Portugal as a world power. And every time you just like in within these puzzling places, multiverse of history, you look at a location, you find you know, traces connecting to every corner of the world, right? So, um, like, I don't know, like, these guys, by sponsoring, let's say, the trip around, they were extremely Christian, which also affected uh, very much how they did politics, uh, the whole, and as I mentioned already in the Behind High Walls dev chat, the whole agreement uh, of which direction Spain and uh, Portugal were allowed to sail to get to the Indies, basically led to the discoveries of America. Um, and yeah, this is this is it. This was the embodiment of all that. Um, 
Very nice location. So we'll yeah. probably and go back to this it. is on Sketchfab, and uh, we'll have the link in the description on YouTube, so you can um, you, know, yeah. you can t take a look there. And also, we'll put a link to the rest of your Portugal scans because you have quite a few others that you've. Scanned yeah, I have well. a collection there. We we were planning planning to actually do a pack around it, but the quality is unfortunately. As I scan, I was scanning this, and one of the things with photogrammetry is that when you're scanning, you need to know the quality you want to want at the end. And I scanned this during the Patreon time and we were doing like 100 piece puzzles. And I was like, oh, okay, this is more than enough for a 100 piece puzzle. And then, you know, we did 200 piece puzzles and now we're doing 400 piece puzzles and PlayStation has a thousand piece puzzles. Um, so it gets always a lot uh, harder and harder. So to the time point as I was scanning this, the, I was using a DJI Mavic 2 and that only had like 15 minutes of battery time, um, which, in a location like this, it's not a problem because no one was there. I just felt like no one cares, you know. Uh, but usually, if it's a bit more touristic, people start looking for you. And if you have to change battery, you know, that's when they get you <laughs> because they can locate um, the the pilot. But, uh, yeah, so it's actually quite challenging. And also, the other thing is that uh, you can see with the trees, these trees actually turn out to be very good. Yeah. Um, and that's extra because I didn't want to fly too close to them. If you fly very close to the trees and I take pictures from too close, it's going to mess up the shape. Uh, it's going to make it too complicated. Um, but this architecture had a lot of like tiny details. So um, yeah, every, everything really came out to be quite consistent throughout the the monastery. So that's that's uh, that worked out really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so the thing is, like, I already had that with a lot of the other locations that I, I scanned which was, okay, how do we change this? Well, we, we have talked about that before. A lot of puzzling places is about adding life, you know, to these locations. Yeah. And I think a lot of these locations look amazing during the night. And we always had this idea of, like, turning a scan um, to nighttime, which gameplay-wise would also be interesting because some areas with light would be easier to, um, you know, puzzle during the night. Some would be easier to puzzle during the day. Um so we were trying to play with that, but the core problem was scanning these locations in night is just not feasible because, uh, well, I think if you have like a tripod and like more hours in the night than a normal human being, maybe you can do long exposure and scan these places, but on a, on a, on a drone, like the wind is coming, right? And the drone is always moving. So if you do a long exposure to be able to get good sh sharp images, you basically can't get good sharp images because there's there's always a tiny amount of movement. And that's really bad for photogrammetry. Um, so the idea that we had was, okay, how about we kind of adjust the colors in order to get to the scan that we want? This is, by the way, uh, adjusted for the... Um, as you can see, there's a bit of, like, cloud, hi like, highlights from the sun. And this is actually not untrue to the location itself, like... As you can see in the images here, right. this was a very cloudy day and you can see the clouds were moving really fast and that's why also some part of the scan was a bit darker than some other part of the scan. Um, yeah, so yeah, we were thinking about how to do that uh, actually and uh, one, one idea was, okay, how about we treat it like a film, right? So in actual film production, it's not that untypical for people not to shoot in sunset or during nighttime, but shoot in just completely normal daytime, maybe overcast it, and then color correct it um, so that it looks like the, the thing was shot during nighttime. Um, so we thought about actually doing that too. And of course, one challenge would be, okay, would we have two of the same thing? We would have a day version and a night version. That would be quite a memory strain on Quest because our puzzles are like 100 megabytes. So doubling that memory wouldn't be a good idea. And also performance-wise, we, we had to like, you know, pay the price of basically rendering two different puzzles at the same time, which was very unideal. unideal. So uh, kind of like what came from that was, okay, how about we can get, and I have a blog post about this. If anyone is technically inclined and would like to know, they can go and read the code and everything else. But basically what we were thinking about is, okay, how about we uh, use these things called lookup tables, which is kind of like a, it's a very smart technique. It's basically you have some sort of map that tells you, hey, this color changes in this way, that color changes that way. So instead of having twice of the same thing, you just have a map that converts one one time to the other. And uh, we started like experimenting with these uh, with these things and um, brought the whole like tech for it uh, to to test it. 
And let's see if I actually had from the first test I ever did. Huh. And Shame. lookup Shame tables typically think. are for like they're used in photography and in film or in video production typically where you take like a, a flat uh, looking image and then you apply a, a LUT to it which gives it like a very specific like either film look or like a, a camera uh, look and these are things that you find in like Premiere Pro or Photoshop. Um, yeah, and they're not really used as far as I know, and in, in for like game, uh, like for CG objects, textures. Like I haven't really seen that mm -hmm. before. Um, so yeah, that's a novel typically not for textures, but there are like especially since a while ago, as like with games from Naughty Dog, like Uncharted and whatnot. That's when people, a lot of people from film, started working in game industry, and they thought, oh, it would be nice if we have that filmic way of tone mapping and filmic way mm. of color correction, and they started adding lookup table as post process thing. So I also have rarely ever, I don't think I've ever seen lookup tables in the object texture. It's usually always at the end with the post-process stuff. So um, yeah, that was basically what came out of, of it. So we decided to, we did the tech for it and uh, we basically... Get about that. One more thing though, one more thing. Uh, I mean, this is a CG model, model in Blender. Why don't we just add lights and actually just make it like a nighttime that way where we... Yeah, so the, the main problem with just adding night uh, light and just turning it to nighttime is that um, night is very dark. <laughs> it doesn't make for a very good puzzle. I actually, uh, I'm, okay, I'm just like going on a rant as usual, but here I'm ranting about modern films. Like this is a frame from the Batman um, yeah. and I can barely see anything. And I always like find myself having a hard time understanding what's going on in most of the uh, night scenes in films and whatnot. What we were trying to get was something more like this, which was, well, it's actually quite bright, but it's just a lot more blue, right? So there is a lot of, uh, a lot of like compressed, compressed uh, values, compressed brightness and a lot more blue. So that's what we are trying to get, to get the feeling of the night without actually having to make things too dark for puzzling, because that wouldn't make for a very pleasant puzzling experience. Um, and that's why we have been experimenting with these techniques. Uh, the first time we actually used this technique was with the so-called fortress, where we added the uh, sunset and stuff like that. So instead of just going directly for uh, baking lighting in, how a ray tracer would do it in Blender, which would be realistic, but very dark and not very good for the puzzle, we are like baking maps and then we are partly also painting maps. So Daniel K, uh, our colleague that actually was doing the direction on this, um, he painted these uh, per hand, like the shadows that you see here. He painted all per hand um, to get like exactly the feeling that he wants uh, from these locations. Because, you know, at the end of the day, as a, as a um, let's say, consumers of entertainment, we are not as interested in how things physically really are we're just interested in how our brain thinks things are, right? if that makes sense. So um, sometimes the perfect, the perfect physical application gives you what is physically correct, but it doesn't induce that feeling of night, uh, which we got from this at the end. So uh, yeah, so this is basically what came out of it um, after a lot of like fixing and uh, painting these lights by hand you know, adding these like street lights, like turning on some of the cars and why not. Uh, he also added some new, we tried out some new techniques to be able to make these like windows 100% bright. Um, so a lot of interesting stuff. And obviously from the sound side, we tried to also play with this, uh, with this like combination of back and forth because what we had was a transition, right? So, and during the time of the day, you would hear different sounds. So, when it's early in the morning, you will start hearing like pickup trucks coming and picking up trash. You would hear like shops rolling up their thing. You would, um, you know, hear like some people waking up at five in the morning. Uh, at some point you will start hearing some music and it's like loud because the windows are open because it's a hot, hot country and they're playing inside. So there are all these thoughts and, and things that went in that, that front as well. Um, yeah. yeah, and yeah. it seems like so, people are really liking it. Like we've gotten a lot yeah. of positive feedback from that. Um, and yeah. Then, yeah, like just to also clarify, um, this is also our first sort of single premium puzzle that we have released as a uh, pur purchasable DLC. Um, so we, we of course like to do premium puzzles sometimes as uh, free add-ons or as a premium pack like we did with Behind High Walls. Um, though, as we talked about in the dev chat for that, like that took 
three, four months of development work. Um, and we still would like to do that. But in between those larger productions, uh, we also like to have some experimental things. So that, that's what uh, the point of this puzzle was, is we mm -hmm. wanted to make something fun, something premium, and also, again, experiment with ideas that we've had. Um, and and here the idea was, can we do a, uh, a puzzle that can really change in lighting condition and, and still be fun and still be interesting and, um, and not jarring? And so... I, I think, yep. and I hope we accomplish that here. Yeah, I think I, I just recently played the 400 piece. Uh, and the thing that I enjoyed the most was, again, that thing that it changes gameplay. Because when you're playing, uh, certain areas are quite hard to do during the night. So trees and stuff like that, um, quite difficult. But like anything on the cathedral, because of the lighting, uh, it makes it quite easy to yeah. like be like, oh, okay, this is the area that connects to that. Um, so kind of like changing your strategy of, oh, I'm going to play this now, I'm going to play that. That was quite interesting. And I also loved what Pierre Murray did with the sound. Uh, like adding, again, adding more of that life uh, life cycle. And it's something I always wanted to do, again, adding this like a bit more grounding to, to, to the puzzle because time goes by, right? Um, yeah. And, um, yeah. well, a few people uh, actually asked whether if this, is gonna, this is an effect that we can add to all puzzles. Mm -hmm. um, not, yeah, no, I mean, right? But yeah, I mean, the, the problem is not if technically we can add this to old puzzle. The problem is like, should we add this? To <laughs> because at the end of the day, you know, this is something that uh, you have, right? Like, we, we we can do it in as we are rendering it. We can change these locations, but. Uh, the thing is also, for example, here there's lights, right? So And the lights are painted in by hand. So the lookup table just makes the location look like night, but someone actually has to go in and add the lights and you know add the concepts to it. Right. Um, yeah, we could potentially like do things like, a, like the black and white mode. We could have things like stylized pastel Instagram filter mode or whatever. Um, mm. I don't know why anyone would play that, but uh, that's, that's a thing we can do. Uh, however, again, I think as far as the creative direction of Puzzle Places is concerned, this was a very specifically aimed thing of like we were trying to contrast the mysterious cathedral in the middle of the Portuguese land, like countryside with all these like cities and highways and stuff like that. So we're trying to kind of like bring that together conceptually. I'm not sure how that would gener gener generically kind of fit with all the other stuff we have done in Puzzle yeah. Places. Yeah, and I think uh, it works here from a gameplay perspective, but it might not work in many other puzzles. So that's always something that to be considered as well. Like making something nighttime has its risks, and we don't want to make things more difficult. Uh, and that's why all the lighting here is like there was so much time was spent here to make it so that when you're in the nighttime mode, you do you're not just like okay, I'm gonna wait till it becomes daytime to continue puzzling. It was like no, this actually helps you puzzle some areas that are easier in nighttime than than daytime. And so there's like a very designed interplay between the the day and night cycle here. Uh, that would be a lot yeah, of work exactly. to have to do with every other puzzle. But I think the the idea the the idea was was to prove that this idea sort of works and perhaps we can revisit this in future puzzles that for locations that that might you know benefit from it mm -hmm. yeah also it's just to test uh, like because people keep asking for hey uh, can you do more of the premium stuff like people actually ask us a bunch of time like hey when is the next premium pack like behind high walls is coming out and the truth is uh, at some point we realized okay if you're going to put so much effort and energy into uh, let's say Making a puzzle that is like has all these like insane little things going on, and also like the historical backgrounds and everything else, um, it costs a lot of money. Like you're talking about weeks and weeks of work, right? And we thought about okay, why not just do them as free puzzles? And that's why we were doing like uh, the Halloween, the, the the two Christmas specials, the the Blue Temple. These were all like uh, the Chinese New Year. These were all like the same process of like. A director taking on the task, doing research, coming up with ideation, really like in like embedding some meaning into the puzzle. All that happened for those three puzzles. And the idea with a single premium was like, okay, can we figure out maybe a different financial model where we don't have to, you know, take all the financial risk of like spending months coming up with an entire pack, uh, which people might not even enjoy. So we have a lot of really interesting ideas that affect gameplay in terms of how puzzles can visually change. And what we are trying to do is to kind of pilot test that 
with some of these like single premiums and we will see if people like love a certain idea and it works amazingly uh when we are making free puzzles for the game um we would then add some of those so that everyone who owns base game basically has access to those as well yeah I think what's also interesting is that we have quite a few puzzles coming out at, uh, later this year. So everything from August onward, we have um, a lot of mid-month releases. So th this one was a mid-month release. Battalia came out in the middle of, of um, June. So um, August, September, October, we're, we're, we're planning to have like a very uh, filled <laughs> schedule, uh, both with monthly puzzles as well as like uh, mid-month premium puzzles. And um, I don't know if we've announced any of them yet, but like we're, they're going to be coming from really interesting locations, places like we're, we're looking into a Japan pack, perhaps an ancient Egypt pack. We're working on that uh, hard uh, and very hard to get really beautiful, you know, all the, all the puzzles that you'd imagine from ancient Egypt to be. Um, as well as, what was the other one? Oh, uh, like fr uh, more from France, like especially the castles and the chateaus, uh, things that people really liked about Mont Saint-Michel. Um, so yeah, if you like this puzzle, I think we're gonna be moving in that direction. Maybe not in terms of the day and night cycle, but like really immersive, uh, encapsulating locations. And of course, they're just more difficult to do, which is why we can't do them all the time. But we've been working very hard on, on putting together really, really beautiful packs to come like later this year, especially as Quest 3 launches and some of the developments that we've been doing around that. Um, we also, maybe should we briefly talk about the multiplayer beta? Uh, we launched mm -hmm. uh, a month or two ago. So yeah, we, we announced a closed multiplayer beta a, few, uh, a month or two ago, and um, we have around 150, 200 people that are in there that um, have actively been playing uh, in two-player uh, multiplayer. So that's been pretty fun. Uh, for now, it's quest only, and it's kind of an evaluation of the concept of like, how, okay, do people want to play together? Uh, is it comfortable to play play together? Um, is it worth it for us to continue developing it and seeing if uh, you know where in what context does it work? Uh, so far, yeah, a lot of people have been quite happy with it. Um, we're still kind of like evaluating the data and doing analytics about how to uh, continue with uh, with the concept. But uh, that that's kind of also shows that how, how we're thinking about puzzling places. We is we like to develop things. We like to put them out there. We like to see the response to it, and then from that make decisions about how to move forward. Um, so that's one of them. Sometimes it's a gameplay feature. Sometimes it's a content feature. Um, and we'll we'll have more to announce uh, as the year goes as well. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So to the content, uh, I just want to say that, uh, as you said, more of the historically rel like historically important locations are going to come in the coming few months because we are trying to hit a balance because. When we do like a cathedral, people are like, oh, another cathedral, uh, you know, because some people were just like tired of like, let's say, doing a gothic. Ca well, I don't think we have had any gothic ca cathedral. Except this We've one. had like sections of some. <laughs> yeah, we have had sections of gothic yeah. cathedral. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But yeah, so basically uh, people have different preferences, right? So some people really enjoy things that are a bit out there, a bit different. Some people really want that cultural heritage juice. Um, so we're going to do more of that cultural heritage stuff uh, in the coming few months with like big name locations that uh, I hope make fun puzzles. Uh, yeah. If not, <laughs> if not, you ask for it, you got it. So <laughs> true. I do not take responsibility for that. <laughs> true. We did ask, we put out a survey, people answered, they told us their yeah. favorite and least favorite puzzles. And then from that, we're kind of trying to understand what what is it that you guys want to play? Um, what sort of puzzles? And we've, we, we also have a huge variety, right? We have everything from cars and trucks to dresses to objects to antique things to modern things so and to places, of course. And uh, I think people have kind of like uh, emphasized that they really like places, like locations, beautiful places. Um, and the good thing is that's also our forte. We do like to make those, we like to scan those, we like to create puzzles around that, and also, yeah, expand this puzzling places. Uh, uh, what did you call it? The multiverse? Of puzzling yeah, the puzzles. multiverse, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's ever exciting. Adding locations together. At some point, we should do that globe with the pins. Okay. Yeah, I think to kind of wrap up the, the story of the location, if you guys want to know more about it, 
go on Google for things like Avish Dynasty or John the First. You can uh, just generally Google like the Portuguese uh, naval empire to kind of like get into that. Henry the Navigator to figure that out. The Hundred Years Wars, you do, you, that would be interesting. There's this treaty, I think it's called the Windsor Treaty. That was the, the Anglo-Saxon Treaty that exists since like 800, no, like 600 years now. Um, and how that affected like the relationship of the Portuguese dictator Salazar with, uh, with, uh, with Churchill and stuff like that. So you can go and look that all up. It's all fascinating history. Uh, capsulated in puzzling places now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hopefully uh, you learned something watching this dev chat. Um, if you like this, uh, obviously subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out the rest of the dev chats that we've done uh, over the years. And uh, join our Discord if you'd like to get in contact with us and kind of see uh, more in, in progress things as well. Um, yeah, thanks, Shaw, for joining us and for giving us a, a fun history lesson as well as a CG lesson on, on how to make these things. The CG lesson is nice. <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks all for watching, and we'll see you next time.